Mike Mountain. And I want to give a special shout out to Ralph Anthony Garcia of the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Make sure y'all go to the United Ronin Networks at YouTube. Check out his channel. Check out his series, Ralph Reads. Give it a like. Subscribe to his channel. And um, check out what he got to offer. Some really good stuff up there. This is Mike Mountain, and this message is approved by me. Peace. Jackson is better known to his clients as Daddy Cool, and they know he is the best. He can pull a trigger or toss a knife and never blink an eye. All that counts is the bread and his teenage daughter, Janet. But when Janet is enticed into the stable of a young, smooth-talking pimp named Ronald, Daddy Cool sees red into action with a fearful vengeance. Hey people, welcome to Ralph Reads, brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4, the League. master of ceremonies please like share comment and subscribe tell a friend to tell a friend to tune in to t-u-r-n the united ronin networks we are ronin on today's edition of ralph reads i continue with the story of mr larry jackson also known as daddy cool in this second volume of the Donald Goines miniseries. With every word you can hear it, Mr. Goines is here in spirit, just as well as other lost souls of the youth and the old. Life these days is so intense, on the street and in government. Later for that, I won't make it make sense. For now, let the reading commence. Chapter 4 Janet let out a sigh of relief when the cab pulled away from her home. She had been frightened for one of the few times in her life. Upon leaving, she had feared that someone would awaken her father. Jimmy had threatened to do just that if she didn't make it worth his while. So she had dug down into her tiny savings and given him ten dollars. For him to be her half-brother was more like a curse. Over the years, she had come to realize that she hated the overbearing brown-skinned boy who was by chance her half-brother. But he was different. At times, she could get along with him, but with Jimmy, it was impossible. She settled back in the cab and gave the driver her destination. At the last minute, she had decided to go and check into a motel until she could reach Ronald. After having tried four different numbers most of the night, she still hadn't been able to reach him. 
fast, a fleeting thought flashed through her mind that he was probably laying up with one of the various whores he bragged about having. She gritted her teeth. Well, in time, she reasoned, she'd see to it that he didn't have any of those kind of women. Her father's remark about Ronald one day having her out on the corner made her blush. For her daddy to even imagine such a thing about her was shocking. She had known that her father had no lost love for Ronald, but she had never believed his dislike was as strong as it was. She was shocked by what had happened in the early morning hours. To take her mind off the subject, she removed the small water bill she had saved in her piggy bank. Slowly, Janet counted the money over and over again. She had all of eighty dollars left, so the way she figured it, that should hold her for a few weeks if Ronald didn't do the right thing about her. But as she thought about it, her doubts left. Ronald loved her, so it shouldn't be such a hard job of convincing him to marry her. Once they got married, all she would have to do would be to lead him down the right road and make him get one of the good jobs in the factory. She sat back and smiled as she pictured herself taking care of the house while Ronald was away working. How she would surprise him when he came home, having spent most of the day preparing the kind of meal that she knew he would love. Maybe one day, she dreamt as she blushed that she would have a small baby. Then her daddy would forgive her and everything would be alright. If only her father and Ronald didn't dislike each other so much. She was aware that she was only one of the few people who knew that Ronald really disliked her father. She had never been able to find out just why, but he had a burning dislike for the man everybody called Daddy Cool. Ronald laughed whenever he heard this nickname and called her father Daddy Fool. But in time, she reflected, she might even be able to bring them closer together. Once Ronald really met her father and saw the kindness underneath the cold front that he put out to strangers, they couldn't help but to like each other. Well, miss, the driver said, driving into the driveway of the motel she had asked to be taken to. For the first time since her adventure began, Janet hesitated. She had never been inside a motel before in her life. She only knew about this one on Woodward because she passed it every day when she went to school. She was supposed to have gone to school this morning, but that was a problem she would resolve later. She had brought all of her school books along, so it shouldn't be too much of a problem going back once she got this mess straightened out. She thought about her girlfriends and how envious they would be once they learned that she was living on her own. Miss, the driver called. Again, she hesitated. She really didn't know what to do. Driver, she began. Could I give you the money and pay you to go in and check me into a room? I'll gladly pay you something for your trouble. The middle-aged black driver glanced back at the young girl. He knew she was young, and from the back she had, he believed she was leaving home for the first time. He wondered what kind of chance he would have of coming back later on after he was finished work and spending a little time with her. She was damn sure pretty. It had been years since he'd had the chance to fuck a young girl and one this pretty. He seriously doubted if he had ever had one in his life who looked half as good as she did. He licked his lips, lust flaming in his eyes. Well now, he began, I might just do that for you. If you wouldn't mind my coming back later on and checking on you, you know, he added as he saw anger jump into her eyes. Just to see if you're getting along all right. 
Janet knew just what the old man had on his mind. She was young, but she was far from being a fool. Ever since she was ten, she has seen the look in men's eyes whenever they saw her. Now that she was getting older, she saw it more often. And besides, she had heard her brothers talking about it. At times, Ronald had tried putting his hand under a miniskirt, but she had always stopped him, telling him that she wouldn't do anything until after she was married. Ronald only laughed, but the hot flow of desire was in his eyes and hands. When he kissed her, he could hardly control himself. His hands went everywhere. Suddenly, she decided to use the man's lust to her advantage. After all, she reasoned, she didn't have to open the door when he came back. That might be all right, she said softly, then added. How much does one of these rooms cost for the day? Until tomorrow, at least. The driver rubbed his chin. I don't know, miss. This early in the morning, it's hard to tell. I better go in and find out for you. He pulled the cab out of the entrance and climbed out. She watched him walk away, a strong distaste filling her mouth. Men were beasts, she reflected as she stared after him. He was old enough to be her father, yet here he was trying to hit on her. In a matter of minutes, the cab driver was back. He opened the rear door so that he could get a better look at her legs. From the miniskirt she wore, she revealed long, lovely thighs, which filled his mind with lust. It's going to cost $16, girl, he said, not bothering to take his eyes off her pretty legs. If you should happen to be short of cash, he managed to say, I wouldn't mind loaning you what you need. Again, he wet his lips as he imagined laying his gray head down between her soft thighs. He could feel his penis getting hard, and without really realizing it, he dropped his hand down on it. Janet turned her head away as she fumbled in her purse. No, that's not necessary. I have enough money to last me, she said, and held out a $20 bill. I believe that's enough for the room and for your fare. Whatever else is left, you can have it for the trouble you're going through. He took the money out of her hand, letting his fingers grip her wrist until she almost snatched it out of his grasp. As the man walked away, she could feel herself fighting down the urge to vomit. Please, Ronald, please, she begged quietly. Be home this time when I call. While waiting for the driver to come back with her key, Janet climbed out of the cab and began to remove her suitcases. She wished she knew which room he was getting for her so that she could start carrying them to it. The driver returned, swinging a key from his hand. Instead of handing it to her, he picked up two of her bags and walked off, searching for the number. Silently, she lifted the remaining bag and followed him. She decided at once that she wouldn't enter the room until he was out of her sight. The room was upstairs on the second landing. Janet climbed the steps quickly, but first she had to stop and make him go ahead of her. He had wanted to come up behind her, but she was having none of that. She wished now that she had brought the hunting knife her father had given her. In her anger, she had tossed most of the things that weren't necessary on the bed and left them. Most of the articles her father had given her were left at home. As she followed the man, she remembered the long hours when she was younger that her father had spent with her, teaching her how to throw a knife so that it stuck in the middle of the target. She had become good 
but had never come close to acquiring the skill her father had. He was uncanny. His ability was incredulous. His ability was incredible. She remembered seeing him hit the bullseye 99 times out of 100, never being more than a half inch from the main spot. The cab driver stopped at a room that had 204 on the door. He set the baggage down and opened it. Stepping back, he nodded for her to go in front of him. She stopped and shook her head. Could I have my key now? She inquired in a shaking voice. She hated the little girl sound she imagined her voice betrayed. Janet held out her hand. They stood that way for a minute or two until the driver shifted his feet, not knowing which way to tackle his problem. He had believed that once he got inside the room with her, he might be able to talk her into a little lovemaking. Say, honey, suppose I run across the street to the whiskey store and get us a pint, huh? He asked, coming up with the only way he knew to approach a woman. No, thank you, Janet said coldly, still holding out her hand. I would like very much to get my key from you. I've had a very trying time, and now I only want to rest. Well now, he began. I was thinking along those very same lines. I've been driving all morning, and it would be nice if I stretched out my legs for a while, too. Finally. It dawned on her that being evasive wouldn't do any good. Her cold black eyes became mirrors of black ivory, revealing a resemblance to her father. Mister, I'm trying to be nice about it, she said as she stared into his reddish, weak eyes. He attempted to grin at her, showing broken and yellowish teeth. That's what I was hoping for, honey. And you'll be nice to an old man, he whined. Contempt appeared in her eyes as her temper blew. Listen, you silly old bastard. I'm trying to pull your coat nicely. But if that won't do any good, I took your cab number down. And if you keep f***ing with me, I'm going to spend the dime and call the police and tell them one of the best lies you ever heard. Now, they might not believe me, but by the time you get through explaining it to them, the cab company you're driving for ain't gonna wanna hear about nothing you got to say cause I'm underage and you ain't had no reason to come to the motel with me. She saw the fear leap into his eyes and continued. Now, I'm going to ask you but one more time to give me my key. I paid for it, and I want it with no more bullshit. The man began to struggle with his anger and fear. Her words had shaken him to his very being. It was easy as hell for her to cause him trouble. He realized at once, and at his age, if he lost his job, his ass would be up Shit's Creek. Now, now, young lady. It ain't no reason for you to carry on like that. I ain't mean no harm. None at all. He whined as he fumbled with the key. He stuck it into her outstretched hand. That's one hell of a way for you to carry on, girl, after the trouble I went through for you. You got paid for it, didn't you? She said, still not stepping into the room. She stood with her hands on her hips until she saw him go down the stairway. Then she waited, standing at the rail until he got in his cab and started it up. A great feeling of relief overcame her as she stumbled into the room and slammed the door behind her. She made sure the lock was on, then fell out across the bed and began to weep. Deep sobs escaped from her. Her back rose and fell with the passion of her tears. Desperately, she buried her face in the pillow and repeated Ronald's name over and over again. 
It seemed as if the tears and the repetition of her boyfriend's name gave her some kind of relief. Eventually, she stopped crying and a sweet balm of sleep overcame her. She drifted off with her tear-streaked cheeks buried into the soft pillow. Chapter 5 Daddy Cool listened to his wife clearing the breakfast dishes away from the large dining room table. Her two sons still sat at the table, their heads down, as they stared silently at the floor. Pacing back and forth in the living room, Larry stopped and glared back at the two boys in the dining room. His eyes were bleak as he took in their crestfallen appearance. For the past half hour, he had been given both the boys tongue lashings for their stupidity in allowing their sister to run away from home. It had been over a week now since Jan had left, and since then, Daddy Cool had done something he had never imagined himself doing. He had reported her runaway to the police. Now I'm telling you two worthless bastards, Daddy Cool began again. I want ya out in the streets, finding out where that punk ass would be pimp got your sisterhood. If you can't find out where she is, find out where he is. If I can't find his ass, I'll find out where Janet is staying. You can bet on that. Daddy Cool resumed his pacing up and down the long, well-furnished living room. Buddy, a slim, brown-skinned boy with the beginnings of a sandy-colored beard, tried to reason with his stepfather. Dad, take it easy, man. Don't you know you'll be the first person we tell? I mean, he added as he saw his stepfather stop pacing and listen to his words. It's like this, man. Everybody who knows what's happening is keeping the news from us because it's common knowledge you're real upset over this sh**. Upset ain't the word, Jimmy cracked, then regretted his quick retort. You better damn well believe upset ain't the motherfucking word, Daddy Cool stated, glaring angrily at the young boy. You give me the impression that this is all a big fucking joke to you, Jimmy. Jimmy quickly shook his head, denying what was really the truth. This was the first time in his life he had ever seen anything upset his stepfather, and he enjoyed the older man's discomfort. But common sense told him he had better conceal his enjoyment if he wanted to live at Daddy Cool's house. His mother had already told him that they were walking on dangerous ground, and it wasn't beyond their stepfather's imagination to kick both of them out into the streets. There was nothing their mother could do about it either, because she had been informed that she could follow them if she felt so inclined. The very thought of the bastard telling his mother some sh** like that filled Jimmy with a silent rage that he anxiously concealed. Nah, Jimmy answered slowly. I don't see nothing funny about none of this. I'm just as worried about Janice's whereabouts as the rest of you. Daddy Cool stared coldly at the young boy. He couldn't be sure of his suspicions, but if he ever found out that Jimmy actually helped her to get away, there would be hell to pay. The ring of his private telephone came to his ear. There were two telephones in the house, one everyone could use, and the red one, which stayed in Daddy Cool's bedroom with a lock on it. He never used it to make outside calls. It was there for one reason, so that his private clients could reach him without any delay. 
Angrily, he stalked off toward his bedroom to answer the telephone. Buddy glanced over at his younger brother. You better play it cool, Jimmy, and try to keep that sneer off your face. Daddy Cool ain't playing, man. He's really upset over this shit. Jimmy glared at his older brother. Man, he drawled. Bloody cool. The words were low enough so that no one except his brother could overhear them. Buddy shrugged his wide shoulders. Okay, smart sad, you make your own bed, so you'll be the one to end up laying in it, Buddy stated, then added, As far as I'm concerned, I like living here where I'm not bothered about paying rent and buying food, so I'm going to do everything I can to help find Janet. Whatever you do, please keep it to yourself, because I know you ain't got enough sense to get on the winning side. What do you mean by that? Jimmy asked sharply. You know what I mean, Buddy replied. Ain't nobody no fool unless it's you. I got the wire about you riding around with Ronald yesterday, man, so don't play games with me. If you've been around Ronald, you know where he's keeping Janet. In fact, you more than likely have seen her. Jimmy grinned crookedly. Oh man, where you keep getting bullshit wires like that, huh? But it was a fact that he had written with Ronald for a little while. The man had wanted to know what Daddy Cool was doing and had paid Jimmy $50 for telling him that Daddy Cool had turned in a missing persons report to the police. Ronald had cussed and called Daddy Cool all kinds of names. But nevertheless, he had taken precautions after that and made sure that Janet stayed inside. The last thing he wanted was to be busted for having a minor in his company. Buddy watched his brother's lips pull down into a sneer. Man, he said sharply, you think you're doing something slick, Jimmy, but you ain't doing nothing but getting ready to f*** yourself up. Jimmy waved his brother silent. Dig, buddy. I know what I'm doing, man. All this ish about daddy cool this and daddy cool that, it don't mean ish. Maybe 10 or 15 years ago, daddy cool was somebody. But now, he ain't nothing but an old huggin who runs a pool room. You know what, Jimmy? Buddy stated. I see now what your problem is. You're just a mad night fool. That's all. Ain't no way anybody with common sense will make the mistake you're making about Daddy Cool. Jimmy sneered. Man, f*** that shit. I don't even care to hear about it no more, you dig? Buddy just shrugged his shoulders and he stared at his younger brother. He realized there was nothing he could do. Jimmy would just have to learn the hard way. That was the only way he'd get the message. After leaving the front room, Daddy Cool hurried into his bedroom. Before picking up the telephone, he thought about who it might be and knew at once who it was. The same person had called him last night, and he turned the job down. Now, before even picking up the receiver, he wasn't sure it would be Al on the line again. He just didn't want to take no for an answer. If it wasn't for the difficulties he was having at home with his daughter, he would have taken the job, but the way things were now, he knew that his mind wouldn't be completely on his work. Hello, he said, cradling the receiver in his neck as he reached in his pocket and got out of smokes. Yeah, this is me. What's happening now? Daddy Cool listened for a second and stated, Al, we went through this shit last night on the phone. If I could have seen my way clear, I would have taken the job then. No, man, it ain't the money. I'm not trying to make you go higher. After listening for a few minutes, Daddy Cool let out a low whistle. Oh, boy, you're really trying to make it hard for me to get out of this one, ain't you? Damn, Al, 
25 grand is a hell of a lot of money for a job, and I appreciate you offering it to me. Tell you what, Al, give me a few hours to think on it. I've got problems at home right now, that's why I don't want to leave town right this minute. But for 25 grand, I might have to change my plans. Daddy Cool hesitated, then continued. Call back at 4.30. By then I'll be able to let you know one way or the other just what I'll do, okay? He listened to the man's voice on the other end of the line, then hung up. He smoked his cigarette slowly, thinking about the money he had been offered. It wasn't that he really needed the money, but the idea of passing up such a sweet thing bothered him. Twenty-five grand for a hit was top dollar. God damn this girl! He cursed out loud. Then, seething with frustration, he ground his cigarette out in the ashtray beside his bed. For the next hour, Daddy Cool argued back and forth with himself, always keeping in mind the amount of money he would lose if he did what his heart wanted him to do, stay at home and find his wayward daughter. Nuts to that shit, he cursed. I'm not about to let any damn girl or woman knock me out of that kind of money. Determined now to take the job, Daddy Cool picked up the private telephone in his room, only to slam it back down. He stalked out of the bedroom and went into the front room. There he picked up the receiver and dialed the number to his pool room. Hello, Earl, he snapped. Yeah, this is Earl, came the reply. For a second, Earl couldn't catch the voice on the other end, but as Daddy Cool began to speak, Earl finally understood. Listen, Earl, I'm thinking about taking a trip. I got a job I gotta handle, Larry stated. You want I should go along with you? Earl asked, his voice not revealing any of the horror the big man had for going into the street. No, I can handle it myself, Earl. But what I want you to do, while I'm gone, is stay on this thing, dealing with Janet. If you find out where she's at, don't make any moves. I'll call you when I get to Los Angeles and let you know where I'm staying. So all I really want you to do is be my ears while I'm gone. You want I should take care of the pimp? Earl asked. For a second, Daddy Cool hesitated, thinking the request over. It would be a good time to take the young pimp out of it. Being out of town was the best alibi in the world. That way, nobody could put the deed at his doorstep. I don't know, Earl. I had better wait a while and find out just how much Ronald is involved with Janet. I hate to do something to the kid, then find out he really didn't have her stashed away somewhere, Daddy Cool stated after slow deliberation. The idea had been such a good one that he was really tempted. It was a wonderful opportunity to get the young pimp out of his hair once and for all. Earl, listening closely, could tell his friend was undecided. It won't be no trouble, Larry. Just give me the go-ahead, son, and I'll take care of it for you. Daddy Cool laughed. Don't be in such a hurry, Earl. All in good time, brother. All in good time. But even as Daddy Cool made the statement, the image of the young pimp flashed across his mind. And for a brief second, he was like some frenzied beast who had caught the scent of his prey. It was hard for him to tolerate the thought of his young daughter laying up at night with the boy. Assassination was really the simplest solution to his problem. Before he weakened and gave Earl an order he might come to regret, Daddy Cool hung up the receiver. He stared down at the telephone while his subconscious mind ran wild, picturing bedroom scenes that it would have been best not to talk about. Invariably, his thoughts came back around to the decision he had made about taking the contract. He debated with himself on the merits of that. 
common sense told him that it was too much money to pass up for any flimsy reason. Janet had made her bed, so she would just have to lie in it. Concentrating on the upcoming job, he was finally able to put the brooding thought of Janet out of his mind. When the telephone in his bedroom began to ring, Daddy Cool walked hurriedly to answer. He picked up the receiver. Okay, Al, he said quickly. I'll take ten grand now and the other fifteen when the job's finished. Good. Good, came the voice from the other end of the line. You can come over now and get your money. While you're here, I'll brief you on what you'll have to know. We got the punk's address and everything, so all you need to do is get there and handle it in your same old manner. Daddy Cool hung up the phone, then called out to his wife. Shirley, I want you to pack me a few things. I'm going to take a trip to the West Coast, he stated, as his wife came hurrying into the bedroom. Well, I'm gone, Shirley. If you hear from Janet, tell her I'm sorry and ask her to come back home. Tell her I said I'll buy her a small compact car just for her if she's here when I get back. Shirley wasn't surprised by her husband's instant generosity. It was his way whenever he tried to make up for something he had done. Money or gifts were always the result. He believed he could pay for anything. Daddy Cool walked over to his closet and pulled out a heavy strong box. He took a key from his pocket and opened a huge lock on it. Opening the dresser, he removed the $10,000 he had so carelessly thrown inside the dresser. Shirley watched him silently. Again, there was no surprise. She had long ago become accustomed to seeing him with extremely large sums of money, yet she had no idea where it came from. But over the years, she had started putting small things together. Whenever he came back from a trip, he always seemed to have large sums of cash. After asking once about it and getting cursed out for being too damn nosy, she didn't make that mistake again. Her man was a cold one, and she had long ago found out she was out of her element when dealing with him. Now that he had finally made up his mind, Daddy Cool felt better about the whole thing. Maybe this was what he needed, a trip, so that he could get his mind off his family problems. He began to dress with care, and he wondered idly about which technique he would use on this contract. Well, he reasoned, the best thing to do was wait until he knew more about it. Then he could decide on how best to handle it. One thing was sure, though. There wouldn't be any gun used. No, not this time. No way was he going to try and take a gun on an airplane. His best bet would be to just wait until he got to California. Then he would see how the case needed handling. For now, the best thing for him to do would be to hurry on over and pick up the ten grand. Yeah, the thought of the money brought a smile to his cold, expressionless face. Chapter 6 As the warning light came on in the airplane, Daddy Cool felt the old uneasiness that always filled him whenever his plane landed or took off. He quickly fastened his seatbelt, then put out the cigarette he had been smoking. It had been a fast trip anyway, he reasoned. He glanced out the window beside him and saw the lights of Los Angeles down below. To take his mind off the landing, he removed the picture of the man he was seeking and stared at it closely. He would know the face now if he met the man in the crowd. On and off for the past six hours, he had been reading the file he had on the man. The envelope containing the file was still in his lap, though he had orders to destroy it as soon as he was acquainted with everything inside of the small dossier. It told in detail of the man's habits, 
Every little quirk of the man was written down inside the folder. Suddenly, the airplane bounced once, then landed smoothly. They taxied down the runway swiftly. Daddy Cool had that indescribable feeling in the pit of his stomach as the airplane began to slow down. He wiped the sweat off his face and began to take off his safety belt. The stewardess came down the aisle and gave him a bright smile, then asked if he had a pleasant trip. Yes, he replied. I had an enjoyable trip, thank you. He spoke softly, then watched her walk on down the aisle. Now that the plane was coming to a halt, all his earlier apprehensions disappeared. I guess I'll never get used to flying, Daddy Cool told himself. The tall, elderly white woman across from him smiled in his direction when she saw him look up and catch her eye. She had been eyeing the attractive black man ever since she had boarded the airplane, and while on the trip west, she had cursed herself for not having the nerve to have taken the seat next to him. It wasn't every day that she had a chance to meet a man that attractive. Now she watched him stand up and get ready to leave the plane. She realized someone she would have loved knowing was getting ready to walk out of her life. I say, sir, she said, would you help me get my small handbag down, please? Daddy Cool glanced coldly at the woman. He had noticed the glances she had been casting his way all during the trip, but had pointedly ignored them. The last thing he wanted was to get involved with a woman. This was one of his rules whenever he was on a job. He never became involved with a woman. But helping her get her bag wouldn't be an involvement, so he quickly reached up and removed the bag she had pointed out. It was very light, and he knew at once that she could have handled it with ease. Since she was tall, she wouldn't have had any problem. Before, he had only a hunch that she wanted some action, but now he knew it was a fact. Without seeming to be rude, he gave her the bag, then quickly mumbled something that she couldn't understand and made his escape down the aisle. The woman followed slowly, surprised at the handsome man's action. He actually seemed to be in a hurry to get away from her. Maybe his wife was waiting for him, she decided, and slowed her pace down even more. The last thing she needed was a scene with some angry woman. Daddy Cool was one of the first people out of the airplane. He hurried down the ramp and quickly disappeared inside the terminal. With his long strides, he quickly crossed the waiting room and went out the door. He waved down the first cab he saw and gave an address in Hollywood. Daddy Cool settled back and enjoyed the scenery as the cab moved swiftly through the traffic on Imperial Street. The driver reached the freeway and turned onto it. Soon they were moving swiftly in the evening traffic on the freeway. It seemed as if he had just gotten comfortable when the cab pulled off the freeway and turned right on Wilshire Boulevard. In another minute, the cab pulled up in front of an old hotel. Daddy Cool removed his one bag and paid the cab fare. He walked slowly into the dimly lit building. The hotel had seen better days, that he was sure of. If his prey hadn't been staying at the Gilbert Hotel, Daddy Cool would never have chosen it for his lodgings. He checked in under a false name and paid his rent two weeks. That way, he reasoned, the people on the desk wouldn't have any cause to disturb him for anything. After putting his suitcase away, he walked down the hall until he found an incinerator. Quickly, he pushed the folder down inside it and waited to make sure it had fallen down the chute. He made his way back to his room and stretched out on the bed. After taking another glance at his watch, he decided to turn in. There was a four-hour time difference from Michigan, so it was still fairly early. Just ten o'clock in the evening, but Daddy Cool felt tired. 
Before turning in, he took a quick shower and cursed when he found out he didn't have any hot water. Rubbing himself vigorously, he climbed in between the sheets and soon was fast asleep. When the first rays of the morning sunlight came through the window, Daddy Cool climbed out of the bed. He felt refreshed now and decided he could get right on the case. He took a shower, then opened his suitcase and dressed in dark work pants. The shirt he put on was black with long sleeves. Now that he looked more like a working man, he decided he was ready. He stopped in the hotel lobby and set his watch by the clock downstairs. It was just 9 o'clock in the morning, but early enough for people to be up and around. He wished there was some way he could check to find out if his hiding contract man was still in the hotel. Daddy Cool had the number of the informant who had sold them the information in the first place, but he didn't want to contact the man. The less he had to do with strangers, the better off he would be. He crossed the dingy hotel lobby, studying the faces of the few occupants of the hotel who were already up and sipping coffee from a machine and gossiping with each other. He noticed that most of them were elderly people who had more than likely stayed at this hotel for years. The women looked to be in their fifties, while the two men he saw were just as old. Once outside, he walked slowly down the street until he found a restaurant that appeared to be fairly clean. He found a seat next to the front window and ordered pancakes with a large glass of milk. After eating, Daddy Cool caught a cab and rode up to Hollywood Boulevard, where he got out and, beginning at one end of the block, slowly took his time and searched for the small store he was looking for. In the third block, he finally found it. He went in and examined the knives on display in the case. He had the woman pull out two long-bladed hunting knives. These he went over closely. After a long, careful examination, he walked back out without buying anything. He stood outside the store and searched the display windows until he found the knives he had examined in the window display. After that, he took his time and walked around. It was later in the day when he found just what he was looking for. A tall, slim black man approached him and asked for a quarter. What do you want, brother? Some wine money? Daddy Cool inquired, staring coldly at the man. The wine head hesitated for a second. Before he could frame his lie, Daddy Cool spoke up again. I was getting ready to buy me a taste, but if you don't want any, that's cool with me. The man wiped his lips with the back of his hand. The shirt he had on was filthy. Dirt was everywhere. Daddy Cool led the man to the nearest store, then went in and bought a bottle. Then they walked around until they found an alley. There, Daddy Cool knocked the top off the bottle and took a long drink. When he finished, he passed the bottle to his friend, who had been watching him drink with watery eyes. How would you like to make five dollars? Daddy Cool inquired as the man drained the bottle. What do I gotta do, bro? The man asked in a hoarse, whiskey-filled voice. I was going to buy two hunting knives so that when I went fishing, I could use them to clean my fish. But I got to arguing with the woman in the store, and now I'm ashamed to go back inside and buy them myself. I told her I could get them down the street cheaper, but the motherfuckers cost more down the street. Daddy Cool stated, watching the man's reactions out of the corner of his eye. Now I'll give you five dollars to go in the store and get them for me, but I don't want you coming out with the wrong thing. You ain't got no worry about no shit like that happening, the man stated. Good then, Daddy Cool replied, then began to lead the way back to the store. He stopped in front of the display window. I don't want that white bitch there to see me, man. Those are the knives I want. The drunk stared fish-eyed at him. Man, you sure that's all you want me to do? I just want you to do that, and that's all, man. But like I said, I don't want no shit out of you. I know how much they cost, and I'ma give you the right money, so don't go in there and buy the wrong thing. 
If you do, you ain't gonna get no five dollars. Daddy cool pointing out the knives again. You notice the white bone handle on the end? Well, they ain't got no other kind in there, so you shouldn't make no mistake. I ain't gonna make no mistake, man, the drunk replied, still suspicious. Daddy Cool counted the money out in the drunk's hand, then held back five dollars. Now this is yours whenever you come out with the right knives, you dig? The drunk took the money, nodding his head. Daddy Cool watched him stagger off into the store. He smiled as he realized that the white saleswoman would be scared shitless at the sight of the bum. But it was better this way, he reasoned. If the knives were ever traced, she would remember the funky drunk while forgetting about the customer earlier who hadn't bought either knife. In a few minutes, the drunk came out, clutching a bag to his chest. He looked back in the store and cursed. I see what you mean, my man, he said as he came up to Daddy Cool. That stupid bitch wouldn't even pull the motherfucking knives until after I showed her some money. I mean, the man continued, people just don't do business that way. You understand what I mean? Slowly disengaging the man's hand from the bag that contained the knives, Daddy Cool agreed with him. Keeping up a steady flow of bullshit with the man, he checked the package, making sure it had just what he wanted. Here you go, old man, Daddy Cool stated as he removed an old bill from his pocket. He shoved the $5 bill into the drunk's hand. Next time I need a good man, Daddy Cool stated slowly, I'm gonna be sure. To look you up, my man, he said as he began to walk away in the opposite direction of the bum. The bum waved his hand. He was only too glad to see the man he considered a fool leave. All the time Daddy Cool had been talking, the bum had been afraid that the man would change his mind and try to keep the five dollars. Now that he had the money clutched tightly in his fist, he hurried away, wanting to put as much distance between him and the giver as possible. Daddy Cool grinned as he watched the bum hurry away. Without another backward glance, Daddy Cool made his way to the nearest main street and hailed the cab for the short trip back to his hotel. He went up immediately up to his room and relaxed. After taking a quick shower, Daddy Cool removed the two knives from the bag. He began practicing with them until he was well acquainted with each one. After an hour of steady knife throwing, he knew he could hit his target without any trouble. He now handled the two knives as if they had been in his hands since birth. Moving with slow deliberation, Daddy Cool removed the picture of the man he was tracing from his coat and studied it closely. When he finished, he replaced the picture. After dressing in an old dark blue suit that was at least 10 years old, Daddy Cool placed the man's wig on his head. The wig was a bushy natural. He studied the effects of his appearance in the mirror. Not quite satisfied, he took out a jar and opened it. He began applying the lotion from the jar onto the palms of his hands, then slowly rubbed it evenly over his face. After about 10 minutes, he replaced the lid. The effect of the lotion was instantly recognizable. His skin color had changed slightly. Now he appeared to be much darker than normal. The tanning process had worked quickly. Instead of there being a light-skinned black man, now there was a brown complexion man staring back at him out of the old dresser mirror. Taking his time, Daddy Cool went into the toilet and washed his hands, making sure there were no traces of the mixture he had used. Daddy Cool took one more look at himself in the mirror before leaving. After that, he let himself out into the hallway. Daddy Cool walked down the stairway and made his way into the lobby. He bought a cup of coffee out of the machine, then found a soft cushioned chair and sat down. He picked up an old newspaper lying on the table and hid his face behind it. The seat he took allowed him to see everybody who came in and out of the hotel door. 
He was visible only to the people who walked in the area on the right side of the desk. True, anyone taking the stairway up or down would be able to see him clearly, but for the people coming in and going up to the desk, he would only be an outline. For the next two days, Daddy Cool continued to keep his close watch on the lobby. On the morning of the third day, he broke luck. The man he had been waiting for walked through the entrance of the hotel carrying an overnight bag. It dawned on Daddy Cool at once that his prey was just returning to the hotel from some trip. For the past days, the man hadn't been living at the hotel. The key to the man's room was behind the desk on a peg, which Daddy Cool had noticed before. Now the desk clerk took the key down and pushed it under a bulletproof glass that separated the clerk from his customers. From out of the corner of his eye, Daddy Cool watched the man take the key and head for the elevator. The man looked around the lobby nervously before the elevator arrived and he stepped inside the cubicle. From his movements, Daddy Cool knew the man was nervous. That much, at least, was obvious to anybody. As the door closed behind the man and the elevator started up, Daddy Cool began to put his plan together. It had been impossible for him to make any complete plans earlier because he hadn't been sure that the man was still staying at the hotel. Now that he was sure, he could get the job over and done with. And the sooner, the better. He quickly dismissed the idea of just knocking on the man's door and making the hit on him when he opened it. Anything could go wrong with the hit if he tried it that way. The man might come to the door with a pistol in his hand, or somebody could step out of an apartment just when he got ready to knock the sucker off. No, it would have to be done in a different way. But how? The question leapt through his mind. How? 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 Ruthlessly, he dismissed one idea after another until he thought his head would burst. The last thing he wanted to do was expose himself to danger. It would have to be done smoothly. There could be no mistake. On the third day of his constant watch, Daddy Cool decided that something would have to be done. To bring things to a head, he was tired of sitting in the lobby with the old people who made up most of the customers in the hotel. Walking over to the coffee machine, Daddy Cool bought his fourth cup of coffee, then walked back to his seat and sat down. If only, Daddy Cool reflected, the bastard would leave his room at night. He had waited and hoped that he could catch his prey out in the street somewhere, but the man never went out at night. Daddy Cool glanced at his watch. It was almost one o'clock in the morning. The midnight clerk had come on duty. Daddy Cool had just about made up his mind to turn in for the night when suddenly the man he stalked came hurrying out of the elevator. The man glanced right and left as he walked swiftly across the lobby. Daddy Cool waited until the doors had closed behind the hurrying figure. Then he got up and began following him. Daddy Cool was just in time to see his man get into a cab. He glanced up and down the nearly deserted street, cursing under his breath as his keen eyes saw the empty street. He cursed harshly as he realized that it was his own fault. He hadn't bothered to rent a car since he had believed he would end up making the hit inside the hotel. Suddenly, Daddy Cool saw a bright headlight swing onto the boulevard from one of the smallest side streets. Quickly, he stepped out into the street from the curb. He raised his hands in the air and began to wave wildly, all the time trying to keep the car in front of him in his eyesight. The cab driver started to stop, but it seems as though, as soon as the driver saw that it was a black man trying to wave him down, he pressed down on the gas pedal, and the cab leapt forward. You hurt us? Daddy Cool yelled after the disappearing cab. 
He turned on his heels and retraced his steps back toward the entrance of the hotel. More angry at himself than he was with the cab driver, Daddy Cool stopped in front of the hotel. It was too hot, he reasoned, to be shut up in the tiny hotel room. Even though there was a slight breeze blowing, the night air seemed to be choking him. As he started to walk around the block, his mind returned to the subject that constantly stayed with him, his wayward daughter. If only he could keep her off his mind, he would be able to take care of the job he was sent out to do. So far, all he could do was reflect on the mistakes he had made since arriving on the West Coast. Altogether, he had made too many errors. In his line of work, mistakes were very costly. At the rate he was going, he reflected, he would end up paying the dues he owed, too. For the obvious reason, he just couldn't bring his full concentration to the job at hand. Janet. Janet would be his damn downfall if he didn't change his ways. He couldn't help but wonder if there had been any changes in the young girl's mind since she had left. Enough time had passed. She had been gone long enough to forgive her father for what he had done in the heat of his anger. There was no reason for her to still hold a grudge against him, yet he realized that was what was wrong. Her temper, just like his own, was her worst enemy. When angry, she didn't take the time to think anything out. She just reacted. As he continued to walk, deep in his moody thoughts, he failed to notice the group of six young boys who turned around and started to follow him on the narrow side street. The darkness of the streets suited his black mood. The six boys crossed over so that they were now about 50 feet behind him. Their steps picked up as they started to gain on the tall black man in front of them. Any other time, Daddy Cool would have recognized the danger he was walking into. But now, with his mind 3,000 miles away, he never even glanced up when the loud sounds of hurrying footsteps should have warned him of approaching danger. The first warning he had when someone tapped him on the shoulder. He glanced around without really thinking of what he was doing. What the hell? Daddy Cool managed to say, then his keen nerves sent warning signs that almost exploded in his head. You fool, he cursed himself. What the hell have you allowed yourself to walk into? The question inside his mind was never answered. Before he could figure out some kind of defense, another hand touched him on the other shoulder. Daddy Cool was a product of the ghetto streets, so by nature, he knew what a trick would run into. Yet, he had allowed himself to fall into the very same trap that tricks ran into every day when they slummed in the black neighborhood after dark. It was even possible that the young group of boys had mistaken him for a white man in the dark. Whatever the reason, only swift action would save him now. Even though the gang now realized that it wasn't a white man they had stopped, they were too far committed to back off now. Whatever the result, they would play it to the end. Knowing that swift action was the only thing that would save him, Daddy Cool still hesitated a second too long. When he did make his move, he was seconds too late. One of the boys had his arm pinned behind his back, while another large black boy slammed him twice in the stomach. The vicious punches brought a gasp of pain from their victim. Daddy Cool bent double from the blow. Another fist struck him behind the neck. Daddy Cool felt like a fool. The beating he was taking was all because of his stupidity. If he had kept his mind open and alert, 
none of this would be happening. Suddenly, he felt a hand feeling around in his back pocket. He wanted to scream out for them to take it. Just take the money and leave him alone. He knew that there were only about $200 in the wallet, plus some funny ID. He wouldn't miss the money or the ID. He only prayed that his attackers wouldn't hurt him too badly. So instead of trying to resist, he played possum. He went limp in the hands that held him up, allowing the hoodlums to do what they would, trying to show them that he wasn't going to give them any trouble. To fight back would only bring down worse punishment on him. Since he couldn't reach the knives he carried strapped to his back, there wasn't too much he could do with just his hands. I got it! A young, excited voice called out. Make sure, goddammit! A huskier voice answered. Remember last time you ran over the fucking wallet and wasn't nothing in it? Ish! The excited voice came again. This bastard was loaded! It's full of big bills! Daddy Cool was thankful that they had found the money. Now with luck, they would run off and leave him alone. But even as the fleeting thought ran across his mind, he was struck viciously against the side of his head. A moan escaped from him, and the pain reached him with a jar. He realized now that the young hoodlums might just decide to kill him in case he had recognized one of them. He grabbed his head and tried to fall to the ground. Strong arms still held him tightly, so he managed only to wiggle around in their grasp. Instantly, blows began to rain on him from all sides. Again, he tried to break the grip that held him. Fear gave him strength so that he finally got one arm free. Damn it! He cursed loudly. Take the money, you bastards, and go! He screamed loudly. His voice rose to a pitch that he couldn't recognize. For his troubles, he received a blow in the mouth that he knew cut his lips. He could taste the fresh blood running from the cut. Not yet, you mother A harsh voice stated. Then all the pain in the world burst loose in his nuts as one of his attackers kicked him viciously between the legs. Without warning, the pavement came up and struck him in the face. He lay stretched out on the cold ground as he heard the footsteps running away in the dark. He knew he should be thankful, but the pain he was feeling was too great. He couldn't understand what he should be thankful for. It seemed like hours, but it had only been seconds when he heard a woman's voice speaking to him. It sounded as if she was a long way away. Are you alright, mister? We saw them boys attacking you from our car and waited until they let you go before we got out. The woman seemed to be waiting for an answer. Then she spoke to the other person with her. Sally, maybe we should call the police. He seems to be hurt real bad. You want me to drive up and find a payphone somewhere? Sally asked. For a second, the other woman hesitated, then spoke sharply. There was fear in her voice. No way, honey. You ain't about to leave me standing out here in the dark. Ish. Them zirgans might come back. At the mention of the police, Daddy Cool's mind began to work. He knew he couldn't stand any police questions. There was even a chance they might search him, and when they found the knives he carried, he would be in the world of trouble. No police, he managed to say. Please, just get me to my feet, he begged the woman nearest to him. As she began to lift him up, he tried to help her, but the pain was too great. He let out a loud moan. Damn, honey, the woman lifting him said. You're hurt real bad, man. 
Maybe you better go to the hospital and let them look at you. From somewhere, Daddy Cool found the strength to stand up. He managed to stand on his own feet with the woman's helpful arms around him. I'll be okay, he mumbled. If I could get back to my home, I'll be able to handle it from there. The woman stared at him curiously. Well, it's your own business. But if it was me, I'd sure as hell go to the hospital and let them have a look at me. Daddy Cole knew the woman was right, but he couldn't stand being undressed at the hospital. Not as long as he carried the brace of knives strapped to his back. Maybe after stashing the weapons in his room, he could then take the risk of going and getting medical help. But not until after he had cleaned up. He tried to stand up without the help of the woman. There was a sharp pain in his ribs. But other than that, he felt as if he was all right. First, he tried to take two short steps. The pain was sharp, yet he believed it was possible for him to walk. If only he didn't have to walk all the way back to his hotel. Miss, he began, if you will be so kind enough to drop me off in my home, I'll gladly pay you for your trouble. The heavy set black woman glanced at him curiously. She seemed as though she would say no, so. It's only a couple of blocks away, miss, and I'll gladly pay you for any trouble it will cause you. Before she could answer, her friend spoke up. We might as well, girl. He can't hardly give us any trouble when he can't even walk. The woman helping Daddy Cool glanced over at her friend. Okay, she finally said. I guess we can't do that much for you. Between the two women, they helped him to the car. When he bent down to get into the car, pain exploded inside of him. For one brief moment, Daddy Cool thought he would pass out. Gradually, the pain became bearable. He gritted his teeth and fought back the tendency to faint. He was glad to see the hotel after directing the women to it. At first, he wanted to give them the wrong address and get out near the hotel, but the pain was too harsh. He didn't believe he had the strength to make it without their help. You should go to the hospital, the woman called Sally stated sharply. Daddy Cool tried to smile. I would go, but I don't even know where the hospital is at. And, he continued, not giving the woman time to speak. I don't even have enough money left on me to catch a cab back. After I go up to my room and get me some money, I'll take your advice and seek out a hospital. After the woman driving parked in front of the hotel, Sally, sitting on the driver's side, climbed out and held the door open for him. You see, she said as he tried to get out without her help, you can't even stand up by yourself. This time, Daddy Cool didn't attempt to smile. The pain was too great. I must go up to my room and get some money, he finally managed to say. If you ladies would be kind enough to wait and take me to the hospital, I'd be willing to pay you for your troubles. But I must get me some money, he stated. It wouldn't make sense coming out of the hospital and having to catch a bus. The driver began to shake her head. I don't know if we'll have that much time, she stated, staring past Daddy Cool and catching her friend's eye. Oh, s***, Doris, Sally said. It won't take that much time to just drop him off at General Hospital. You can see he ain't in no shape to help himself. Before Doris could answer, Daddy Cool added, I'll give you ten dollars for your trouble, miss. The driver hesitated, then said quickly, Okay, if you don't spend too long up in your room, because I've got to be getting on. You want me to help you? Sally inquired when she saw the trouble he was having trying to stay on his feet. Daddy Cool could only nod his head. The woman put his arm around him and started for the door. Before they reached the entrance, Doris joined them. Between the two women, they managed to get him up the steps of the hotel. 
The desk clerk glanced sharply at the threesome as they came into the hotel. Daddy Cool didn't have to go to the desk for his key since he made it a habit to carry it on him at all times. They took the elevator upstairs while the few people still up stared at them curiously. Once upstairs, Daddy Cool managed to open his door. Again, the women stayed right with him as he went into the small bedroom. The only way he could get some privacy was to excuse himself and stumble into the tiny bathroom. Once inside with the door closed, Daddy Cool had to fight back the weakness that constantly tried to overcome him. He finally was able to take off his coat, then remove his shirt. For a second, he thought he might have to ask one of the women to come in and help him take off the harness that held his knives. But with the strength of desperation, he struggled with the catch until he was able to take it off himself. Sweat rolled off his forehead from the incredible pain that racked his body from the struggle to remove the weapons. He let out a sigh of relief. Are you all right? Sally called out. Yes, he managed to reply. Picking up his shirt, he carried it over his arm as he opened the door. One backward glance assured him that the knives hidden under the bathtub couldn't be seen from the doorway. Both women stared at him closely as he came out. He walked over to the closet to remove one of the suitcases, but it hurt too bad for him to bend over. Please, he pleaded as he kicked at the suitcase that he wanted. Sally saw what he wanted, picked up the suitcase for him, and carried it over to the bed. Please, he asked, standing beside the bed between the women. With a shake of her head, Sally quickly obeyed his request. For a second, Daddy Cool hesitated to reveal so much money to the women, but he knew he didn't have any other choice. As soon as he opened the buckles, he flipped back the lid. Most of his money was hidden under some white shirts, so all he had to do was slip his hand under the clothes and remove one of the bundles. The small bundle of money he pulled out was still wrapped in the white money wrapper. The sum on the wrapper read $500. The top bills were brand new $100 bills. He flipped the top bills back and extracted a $20 bill. Taking it loose from the rest, he held it out to Doris. Then he removed another $20 bill and gave it to Sally. Both women tried not to accept the money, but Daddy Cool could tell they wanted it. He wouldn't listen to their denials. He just pushed the money into their hands. Listen, he stated, I need help, and the best way to get it is to pay for it. I know both of you have something else to do, but if I pay you for your trouble, maybe it won't be too difficult for you to put off whatever you were going to do. Before they could say anything, he added, once we get to the hospital, you can go on your own way. But if you should stay with me, I'll give you both another 20 when we leave. How does that sound? He saw the greed in their eyes as he mentioned money. Well, Doris began. Whatever I had to do, I sure as hell wasn't going to make $40 at it, so I got the time now. Sally seemed to be ashamed. She stared down at the floor. It seems funny to accept money for helping somebody, but my kids could sure use the cash. Well, then it's settled, huh? Daddy Cool managed a slight smile as each of the women moved to one side of him to help. Daddy Cool reflected on the merits of money as Doris drove swiftly to the nearest hospital. Since giving the woman the money, he couldn't help but notice the change in them. Money made people function better, or so it seemed. Though he had their help without paying them, they seemed even more helpful after he gave them money. He knew he had taken a chance letting them see his money, but since one of them had on a nurse's uniform, he didn't think he had too much to fear from them. They were just hard-working black women. 
Even if the thought of robbing him had passed through their minds, they were not of the caliber of robbers. It was something he could sense. At the hospital, the two women waited patiently while doctors bandaged up Daddy Cool's ribs. He walked out slowly and informed the women that he had two broken ribs. On the ride back to his hotel, he had them stop so he could buy them both for dinner, ordering his to be taken out. With the hot food in his lap and his ribs wrapped up, he realized that the situation he had fallen into could have turned out a whole lot worse if it hadn't been for the help of the two black women. He felt a deep gratitude for their help and a slow anger at himself for allowing his mind to linger on his silly daughter to such a degree that he walked into a trap that any child in the ghetto would have avoided. At the hotel, he thanked the women, then removed the hundred dollar bill from his bankroll. They tried to turn it down, but he knew they wanted it. After giving them the money, he said, Well, sisters, I've seen enough of California. I think I'll catch the morning plane back to New York. Daddy Cool removed a pencil from his pocket and wrote out a fake address. If either of you are ever in New York, just call me at this address and I'll show you the town. Take care now, and be sure you don't walk into any muggers. He flashed his smile at the women before turning on his heel and limping slowly toward the hotel door.